This episode and every episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Ironmonger Brewing. Visit Ironmonger at their tap room in Marietta, Georgia, or online at ironmongerbrewing.com. Open up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yeah, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt. Welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios in Marietta, Georgia. This is episode 215, and this week we're talking with 5050 Brewing. I'm Tim Dennis, and with me as always is my good friend and co-host, Brian Hewitt. Hey, Tim. So joining us today, we have Alicia Barr, the co-founder, president, and chief experience officer at 5050 Brewing. We're going to talk about 5050's growth, brewing award-winning beer, and of course, barrel aging beers like Eclipse. Alicia, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're, we're big fans here. You know, we've until recently, Alicia, you were kind enough to send us a few beers and we pre-gamed with your West Coast Haze, which is the first non-Eclipse 50-50 beer I've had. Same so, here. Yeah. Yeah. I've had I've had plenty of Eclipse. Well, it's awesome. So, you know, up until maybe even last year, I think all anybody knew us for was Eclipse because we were so tiny. Um, so we're finally excited to get more more goodies out there. Yeah, it's nice. And I think we just started getting some of the Eclipse beers on shelves here in Georgia maybe a year ago. Something so. like that. Wasn't that long ago uh, that that we started seeing them here. So that was nice being able to. I saw some uh, some of the more interesting bottle shops somehow had them two or three years ago when Sprout. they weren't officially here. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe, well, two years ago, probably the 2017 batch of Eclipse was the first okay. that yeah. legally at least <laughs> uh, <laughs> made its way out to Georgia. And then again in 2018, and then um, this last shipment also went out there. So we're excited to be part of the uh, the regular rotation now of having Georgia and Eclipse. Awesome. Good stuff. We are too. Absolutely. So Alicia, how's your week going? Anything exciting happening out there in California? Well, we're uh, we're a little confused seasonally right now. It's supposed to be February. We're supposed to, you know, we live, we're up in mountains, Lake Tahoe area, big snow area, and it's been 60 degrees all week and not a whole lot of snow. But it, it, we feel guilty enjoying the sunshine when we know it should be snowing. But it's been lovely. I think we're having weather identity crisis here in Georgia yes. too, because we had no snow at all, not even a snowflake until I think it was like February 8th. And we got, I'm north of the city, like 30 miles north of Atlanta. And I got maybe an inch or two inches that stuck for all of four hours. You know, and that was <laughs> it. And then two days later, we're up to like 76 degrees. Then yeah. it's back down to 23. So we have no idea. But we've had plenty of rain. No shortage of rain here for the last couple of months. And clouds and fog. Yeah, a yeah. bunch of it, especially yeah. in the past couple of weeks. Oh, Been yeah. Nuts. Yeah. Brian, what'd you get into this week? Yeah, so I, I did a variety of things. One of the th first things I did was uh, made a trip over to Hop Sticks and checked out some of their uh, various beers. One of the big things that really had me going there was that they had a single hop pale ale called uh, Going Solo. It has HBC 472, that experimental hop we talked about. Right. I think it was yeah. last week that mm -hmm. purportedly had the bourbon barrel and the vanilla and all the neat character that you would did expect. Did you get those flavors from it? No. Okay. I got all wood, right. and it it was a, a wood that was a little out of place possibly in that. It wasn't unpleasant. I thought it was a good beer. I thought uh, it delivers on wood, and the, the, the beer itself had a good amount of fruity notes to it. It wasn't quite what I was expecting. Okay. I also kind of thought there'd be coconut involved because it and a preceding experimental have coconut in. I didn't even get the coconuts. So. Okay. Interesting, though. Interesting. It's, okay. a dip, it's very different than what I've had before. So. Alicia, are you familiar with that hop? Have you guys played around with that one? We haven't tried that one yet. We do love grabbing experimental stuff and, you know, especially playing around with single hop pale ales uh, at the pub doing some pilot batches, but we haven't messed around with that one yet. Okay. That's, I want to try a beer with it. We've got another brewery here. Wild Leap, who I think is actually on next week. Uh, that maybe. could be right. Yeah. But they've got a, one of their latest releases is uses that hop. So we'll check it out and see what it is. It'll Should be, be interesting fun. to yeah. see uh, the differences. So what did you do Tim? Well, Brian, I think the big thing for us is we were invited to Terrapin tap room at the battery at Atlanta at Truist park used to be SunTrust park to be judges for their wake and bake off. And uh, the Wake and Bake Off, they take their coffee, oatmeal, imperial stout, a Georgia staple, classic Georgia beer. Sure. Wake and Bake goes, but the w days of way back in Georgia beer. But every dish is made with Wake and Bake. 
and they may be savory dishes, sweet dishes. So we had the hard job of drinking some pitchers of coffee, oatmeal, imperial stout, and uh, being served creative dishes to to judge. It's a so. really rough way to start your day. It was it was <laughs> tough, you know. We but we hung in there, Alicia. We hung in there. We made it through. Brian, what was your favorite dish of the Wake and Bake Off? Oh, it was easily that uh, oatmeal cream cookie I, thing with the the I dip. Agree with it you. looked really good. Yeah. It tasted really good. I felt like, like I was on one of those cooking channel, cooking, sure. you know, food channel shows where they just judge people, give you an interesting basket. Except that basket just had a beer in it, a beer can. So. <laughs> it did. It yeah. was great. Yeah, that was a good time. We had a blast, and I think the oatmeal pie actually won. And uh, I feel bad for little Debbie now because she's got nothing on. Oh, yeah. On those oatmeal pies. Little Debbie has been there. schooled. If she can't add beer to her. She's kind of at a huge disadvantage just to get started. That's yeah. a good point. Are you even trying over there, Debbie? <laughs> yeah. What's going on there? <laughs> so, yeah. But Brian, as you know, the, this, the part of my life I like to call doctor's orders. I'm currently ex- experimenting with some uh, non-alcoholic beers. Uh, I don't have to quit. Thank goodness. I don't have to quit, but the doctor asked me to kind of watch my alcohol intake. So that's what I'm doing. And I figured if you're going to make me watch my al- alcohol, I'm going to try out some of these non-alcoholic offerings out there because there's getting to be more and more. Yes. Um, unfortunately, Brian, so far in most of our experiments, there's not a lot of good ones out there. There's more of them. They are not good. But we did find one this week that I think actually both of us pretty well liked right yes yeah so athletic brewing company which we had on the show about a year ago to talk about na beers they do one called run wild ipa brian it's it's pretty much an ipa i mean pretty much flavors the flavors there the aromas there we also tried an ipa from a company called groovy g-r-u-v-i and uh, that one had a fantastic aroma and the taste was almost but not quite as good as athletic so you know there's people who kind of who still kind of snub these na beers but for a variety of reasons doctor's orders pregnancy or alcohol issues you know for any reason someone may want a beer and either can't or chooses not to have alcohol and uh at least there's starting to be more options out there yeah there definitely are and i think that uh at least athletic because we had them a year ago we can tell they they're improving the process that was a better beer this year than it was last year and i I do remember that so speaking of beer tim what about the beers of the week Crack open a cold one. It's the Truck and Tap Beer of the Week. Craft beer and food trucks in downtown Woodstock. Truckandtap.com. Well, Brian, as always, we've got a few really, really good ones to get into. As we mentioned, it's all about 50-50 this week, Brian. And since uh, we've got some big boys from them, we're not going to have a too of an extensive of a list. We did pregame with their West Coast Haze, which is a really nice IPA. Enjoyed that one a lot. We have a couple of eclipses here. One courtesy of 50-50. We have the 2019 Eclipse. We have the Rye Cuvée that we're going to get into. And Brian, you dug into your cellar, and we have here, I believe it is the 2015 Grand Cuvée. Is that Grand correct? Crew? The, Grand the Gold crew. Wax one. Gold so. Wax Grand Crew, yeah. So yeah, we've got one from the cellar, Alicia. So we're going to see uh, see one of these from the, the from about five years ago and one here fresher. Well, Brian, what's happening this week in the news? What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. All right, so we have some tragic news in the beer world this week. There was a shooting inside a Molson Coors facility in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The gunman was apparently an employee of the facility, and he killed five of his co-workers before he turned the gun on himself. As of this moment, we don't have a lot of information about this. We don't know the name of the shooter or the reason for the shooting, but you know, our thoughts and prayers are with the, uh, the victims and Absolutely. their families. Absolutely. Yep. So after that, the big news of the week is Next Glass, who is the parent of Untapped, they've acquired Beer Advocate. That's right. Untapped now owns Beer Advocate. The deal was announced this week on the Beer Advocate forum and then written about just about everywhere else in short order. According to both Beer Advocates, Todd Alstrom and Untapped's Greg Avola, the two entities will continue to operate separate platforms. User bases will not be merged. Ratings will be not altered in any way on either platform. In short, they will continue to operate independently and have separate branding and separate websites. But Beer Advocates uh, Extreme Beer Fest will continue to happen in the future. And uh, yes, Untapped slash Next Glass does have your data, Beer Advocate users. So they will be doing whatever they do with that, probably selling something stuff something from it. Yeah. Theirs, yeah. And with this news comes a little insight into the motivation as to why a popular website like Beer Advocate would, would sell. And basically, they'd been struggling to, quote, keep the lights on for about two years. And that a lot of that has to do with them shutting down their print, the print magazine, which was That's where they were bringing yeah. in most of their money. So yeah. Uh, so the good news is that the technical expertise Untapped brings to the table. Uh, Beer Advocate 
users will probably see an app happening sometime in the future. I so. know they've been waiting on it. Absolutely. You listen to the Beer Guys radio show. We do need to take another break, but we'll be back very soon to talk more with 5050 Brew. Have you ever thought about owning your own brewery but don't know what it takes to get one built? We're Storytime Construction, and we build breweries. We're Georgia's most experienced and hands-on contractors when it comes to building new breweries and tap rooms or expanding existing breweries. We offer full build-outs, remodeling, and additions, as well as consulting and construction management. Give us a call at 770-733-4343. Storytime Construction. We build breweries. Is your brewery or restaurant flooring all jacked up? Your foundation needs to be protected from heat, chemicals, and other contaminants. At the same time, you want to make sure it's slip resistant and you can clean up your messes with soap and water. You know who to call? ResTech. We've been manufacturing poured in place flooring since 2002 and we've got solutions to fit any facility's needs. Go on and visit our website at ResTech.net. That's R E S T E K.net. Drop us a line and we will come to you for a free evaluation. Oh, yeah. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. To be the man, you gotta beat the man. Woo! Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Remember, all episodes are available on demand. So if you miss the broadcast, get the podcast. Beer Guys Radio is available on all popular podcasting apps. Now, back to our conversation with 5050's Brewing's Alicia Barr. Alicia, thanks again for joining us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. And we decided we were going to start off with something a little a little easy drinker, uh, <laughs> something a little light here. So we've got this, this Eclipse, the Rye Cuvée. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, this one? Yeah, it's a nice low-calorie, low-carb light beer to start your day for sure. Yeah, there we yeah. go. We knew we made the right decision. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, a little history on Eclipse. We've been doing it for about 12 years now. And it it started as, you know, isolating various barrels, you know, whether it was a Woodford Reserve or a Jack Daniels or what have you. And then, you know, maybe about four or five years ago, the pastry style started coming into popularity. And so we started adding those to the mix. Me personally, I'm more of the classic uh, what we call straight up barrel treatment kind of Eclipse fan. Um, I just love the nuances of the oak and how that plays with the, the bitterness of the stout, but also those like chocolate and um, vanilla characters you get from the base beer. Rye Cuvée, I think is one of, it's my personal favorite as far as the barrel treatments go because rye bourbons with that spice just really pairs nicely with the sweetness of the stout. And I just think that combination of flavors can be really fantastic. And so we basically just take the best of all the rye bourbon barrels that we acquire throughout the year and blend those together for the Rye Cuvée. So it's one of our longest lasting beers too, as well as if people are cellaring it, you know, five plus years in the right conditions, it actually is fantastic. And just straight out of the bottle, it's, it's, it, to me, it's one of the highlights we do every year. So I could see how that spice would help it stand the test of time as it kind of mellows out. You're still going to have a little of that spice to give it some character. How many different rye barrels? I, I love rye. I, I love rye. I saw that that was sent over and the fact that you're such a fan of it is great. What, what are we looking at in terms of rye barrels that went into this? How many different varieties? Yeah, I, this year, I believe we it was either four or five different rye barrels. You know, there were some some Jim Beam in there. There were some, I wish I had the list in front of me. Um, there were some uh, Bullet Rye in there. We might have thrown in some Willet this last year with that. And there were at least one or two others as well. So it's a really fun combination and uh, we joke the hardest part of the job is we literally taste every barrel before we blend it to make sure, you know, everything's aged correctly and nothing's gone wrong. It's a tough job, you know, having to go through and taste something off of every single barrel. But we you have it. to. Right. Like we were talking <laughs> yeah. about judging that competition earlier. That's so right. we feel your pain, Alicia. We yeah, feel your I pain know. So, yeah. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here with the 50-50 and, and the beer talk and that. So to back up a little bit, what? how did 50-50 Brewing get started? What led you to open a brewery? 
So uh, my husband and I, we met, we're former engineers by previous life. Um, I was a mechanical engineer at Hewlett Packard for almost 10 years. He was electrical. And we realized that I think the actual quote was we were getting dumber every day. We just weren't passionate about what we did. We were good at it. We did fine. But there was just not that like, oh, I'm so excited to go do something. And so, yeah, we came up with it was a three year plan to get out of debt, you know, come up with some business plans, figure out what to do. We knew we wanted to live in the mountains at the time we were down in the Sacramento area. And after two years, we kind of said, screw it. We're close enough. Let's just pull the trigger and go. And so we moved to the mountains opened 5050 uh, in 2007 and pretty much never looked back since then it's been amazing now i saw something that i found kind of interesting if i read correctly you did not transfer any of your homebrew recipes over to production recipes is that correct that is correct so um i homebrewed for several years uh, and we realized that we visited brew pubs every time we went on vacation so that was really the motivation of like let's do something totally different and something that we love. But we also realized that, yes, we love beer. My home brew recipes were, they were good, but they weren't anything mind blowing. And we wanted someone who was truly an expert and an innovator with the actual science background. You know, it's one thing to brew a, a really interesting batch at home, but to repeat that and make it consistent and quality, that's a different skill set. And so our joke was we knew enough to be dangerous. And, you know, the, the brewmaster that we hired out of the gate, I was in there all the time, all up in his ear and wanted to help and, you know, learn what a, you know, a big system did, not just my little five gallon pot on the stove. And it was fascinating. And, and you know, that, and that, that allowed us to work on the business and really think big picture versus being kind of in the trenches all the time. We were still in the trenches plenty. So Alicia, something you said kind of resonated with me, made me think about uh, my work life, feeling like you're getting dumber every day. That's the challenge of having a very stable job that you're really good at. You're not, <laughs> you're not actually actively learning anything new. You're not picking up any new stuff. You don't have to. You know the systems that you're involved with. And it's so applicable because I was at a job for a long period of time. And honestly, I yes, I was I was falling behind because I was not actively aggressively keeping up with the latest. So it's very easy to get dumber every day. The cool thing about the beer industry is I think that most people get into it. They have to keep an eye on the future because you know what, if you stop making beer that people are looking for, you're going to become irrelevant, you know, sure. so you can't afford to, you know, it's not like that stable uh, technology job. Very true. Uh, we certainly see that on our end and just, you know, it's a very dynamic industry. I think we knew going into it that there was, you know, we opened in 2007. So before the really big boom, and we certainly thought there was an upside in the makings, but, you know, frankly, we had no idea it was going to be as huge as it ended up going. Um, and I, I'm glad it did because, you know, like you said, like we're, we have to stay on our toes and constantly adapt and evolve and, you know, it's the, the opportunities to play with new hops or the opportunity to move to pastry stouts and, you know, things that weren't even in conception when we opened. You're always learning, always growing, and we love it. So what is something that's been a big surprise to you? I, I know we all expect changes in that, but is there anything that's changed since you've opened your brewery that you're like, wow, I, I sure didn't expect that? I mean, honestly, we did. I just didn't expect the sheer volume of breweries that opened. So, you know, just a, a stat that still fascinates me to this day when we op when we were planning our brewery the brewers association has a category they're tracking everything called breweries and planning and we were one of 70 in 2006 as we were a brewery and planning trying to get open and five years later there were 1400 breweries and planning and <laughs> yeah. so just the sheer like you know asymptotic scale of how it exponentially exploded on us was fascinating. And the other one that really surprised me was the hazy IPA trend, right? I mean, beer quality is always, you know, in, in the classic mindset was about clarity and all this, but all of a sudden you're taking, so you're taking what was previously viewed as a flaw and turning it into an absolute feature that people love. And it, I think that was a mind opening experience for a lot of people as far as 
not pigeonholing yourself so much and, you know, having these predefined notions of what's good in a beer and what's not good in a beer. Because the bottom line is, if you like it and it tastes good, it's a good beer. That's We've had some amazingly interesting conversations around hazy in beers, you know, from the old school guys who just are totally opposed to him. I think uh, Mitch still is in Atlanta now. You know, he moved out here to open New Realm Brewing from Stone, and we were talking with him about him, and I guess Mitch had made some comment online, just a comment about, I'm not sure if they're IPAs or something along those lines. <laughs> well, that became, <laughs> that became like gospel that Mitch still hated hazy beers. Oh that's yeah. Funny. And I asked him, I was like, Mitch, you know, you, he's like, you know, that's not really what I said. That's not the way <laughs> I said that. So uh, it's just something that people are, are divided. You love them or you hate them, or there's a lot, plenty of opinions on them. The style guides uh, uh, agree. They yeah. added a new category for Crazy yeah. not just IPAs. Yeah. Most heavily entered category at the GABF last year. So it tells you a lot right there. Good stuff. You're listening to Beer Guys Radio Show. We need to take another break, but we'll be back very soon to talk more with Alicia from 5050 Brewing. <music> Cobb County, Georgia is home to a dozen breweries and distilleries. This March, Cobb Travel and Tourism brings you Bubbles and Brews, a month-long celebration of the county's diverse and talented craft beverage makers. Grab your Brew Pass passport, visit the makers, get stamped, and win sweet prizes. And don't forget to go online and vote for your favorites. Support the local craft beverage community and explore all 12 locations throughout the month of March. Tap into Cobb and get more info at bubblesandbrews.com. As a brewery owner or tap room manager, are you looking for ways to enhance your customer experience while maximizing your revenues? Craft Cellar is a mobile solution that helps your brewery drive sales and attract new customers through online pre-sales for beer releases, events, and memberships. Get details now at craftseller.com. Mention Beer Guys Radio after sign-up and extend your free trial to a full 30 days. Remember, craftseller.com, C-R-A-F-T-C-E-L-L-R.com. The Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Cannibal! Cannibal coming. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. I want to give a quick shout out to our newest radio affiliate, KFAR, 720 AM in Sweet Home, Oregon. Catch Beer Guys Radio and KFIR every Sunday at 5 AM local time. Now back to our conversation with 5050 Brewings, Alicia Barr. Brian, you may not know this, but KFIR is the voice of the valley. Is it? It is. That's the Willamette Valley. All beer drinkers should know the Willamette Valley, where their hops come from. Yep. So 5 a.m. sounds like an early time, but the farmers, the brewers are going to be up. They're going to be having their coffee, and they're going to be listening to the beer guys. Right yeah, that's right. That's exactly what they're going to do. Yes. Alicia, thank you again for uh, for chatting with us here. We wanted to talk with you about something you'd mentioned uh, kind of when we talked before the show that that uh, was of interest to you is, is kind of a growth model. When you went from a pub brewery, to a production brewery and it during a time when the industry was booming you were a lot more controlled in your growth is that correct that's correct yeah um we started at a an incredibly small size um there weren't nano breweries back then but we were less than a thousand barrels our first year probably did crack if i was a thousand until about year five um and then just last year got our production facility up and running uh, hit about 4,000 barrels last year and are hoping to and on track to double that this year to about 8,000 barrels. So, you know, given the context of the rest of the industry, it's been a, a pretty slow growth pattern and, and very intentionally so for kind of a multitude of reasons. Yeah, Good. absolutely. Yeah. Keep, keeping the growth because we've seen a lot of people that, you know, during the boom, they've just grown exponentially. And uh, we saw a couple of people, the West Coast brewers that have looked to come out east and either have canceled plans or, or sold breweries pretty quickly. And then yeah. we mentioned New Realm a little bit earlier, and they got quite a good deal on Green Flash's brewery. Yes, they did. And, and yeah, a pretty quick that was big news there. when that hit, for sure. Yeah, 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 crazy stuff. So I know Deschutes, I was I think thinking was Deschutes out, they canceled when, their plans. And, I was uh, sad about that. They were going to open the, I think it was the pub in Virginia, and I was looking forward to finally having Black Butte Porter over here in, in Georgia. And sadly, no, that's that's still a little ways off. But uh, 
Yeah. So I read something about, and I don't know if this was just a rumor or if it's actually in planning. Were you planning on opening up a facility in Reno itself? Is that something that's in the works right now? That is in the works. Uh, we're hoping to be opened next summer, summer of 2021. Uh, we've always had a, a big following in Reno. Um, it's only you know 30 minutes from Truckee, basically. Uh, but there's just a, there's been a, a food and beer scene revolution in Reno. Um, it's kind of ditched its identity as the the gambling location that can't quite be Vegas, but can't quite be you know maybe some of the casinos in Northern California or whatever. And it's really embraced this art, food, and beer renaissance, and it's been great. Um, so we're putting in basically just another pub and pilot system in the Midtown Reno area, kind of right in the heart of all of that. See, I didn't, I, for some reason thought Reno was just a uh, kind of a blip on the map that there was not much there. It was just kind of a, almost a wild West kind of town. Yeah. Up until about five years ago, it was, um, there wasn't much else, but now all of a sudden like Microsoft has put, um, some facilities out there. Amazon, um, Tesla's battery manufacturing is maybe 30 minutes outside of Reno. So there's been definitely, um, I think they've done from a government perspective, a really excellent job of drawing more of an economic development scene. And like I said, they've just ditched the whole gambling identity pretty much altogether. Huh. That's something. The only thing I really knew about Reno prior to this is, uh, one of our favorite cigar brands. Uh, oh yeah, uh, oh, nice. Illusione. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Their Fumari Cigar Lounge in That's Reno right. is kind of where it, it was born. Out there, Dion Giolito. That's, That's right. That Dion Giolito. That's it. Yeah. That that was my my knowledge of Reno. Cool guy, good cigars. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's about all I knew about Reno. I thought it was kind of the other. We wanted to be the other Vegas. The other I, Vegas. I never, I've never actually been. So. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. The other thing uh, Reno is known for is the Johnny Cash shot a man in Reno. That's pretty much the only other thing people Just know to Reno watch for. him yeah. die. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> you know, interesting that you mentioned Johnny Cash because I was looking the other day. I don't know how I found it, got into some Johnny Cash info, and I found out that uh, I moved to Atlanta from Arkansas 20 years ago. And I found out that Johnny Cash apparently grew up like 20 miles from where I lived in Arkansas. And the whole time I was over there, I had, I never heard that. Wow. You know, that he, we knew about Elvis's birthplace, you yep. know, in Mississippi and that, but I'm just surprised they didn't make a bigger deal about Johnny Cash being over there. Well, he didn't shoot anybody there just to watch the watch. <laughs> no, so that's no. why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something interesting, we we're talking about kind of the geography location of your brewery. You're, you're close to Tahoe there, Lake Tahoe, close to Reno. And I think one of the most interesting pieces of historical geography there is a uh, there was a big party there back in the 1800s. I Speaking believe. Speaking of right? death, it was it was it was a big party. Definitely uh, made headlines. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. We, we've named a beer after that. We have our own Donner Party Porter. Um, okay. The, the joke is, uh, your friends never tasted so good. Um, I was going to ask if there was secret <laughs> quote unquote ingredients, special there. ingredients, special, yes. yeah. sustenance yeah. for a long cold winter. You know all those Crazy. all those fun inappropriate <laughs> taglines. Well, that's I got to reading up on the Wikipedia article on the on the Donner Party and all that, and I didn't realize the brutality of kind of everything about that. Not just there's a lot more than them just eating people, Brian. Not yeah. just the it people. Was, eating. It was a it's violent, a, a brutal, violent uh, trip there. So you're saying the cannibals were actually not nice people. I, is that what you're saying? I can't prove that. I didn't okay. know. They could All have right. been they could have been they could have been very polite. Charming about eating their fellows. Friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Is that is that a uh, an attraction that brings people to Truckee or oh, the, for sure. that area? Is uh, it really? Yeah, okay. There's sure. a, so Donner Lake, it's ten minutes from the brewery. Um there's a big memorial state park there with a museum and a giant statue commemorating the the tragic winter of the Donner Party. Um there's the emigrant trail goes right through town, basically. Um, and I mean, that is the trail that they traveled on. So there's a lot of, you know, local schools cover that in their history sections. And it's definitely a very iconic piece of local local lore, so to speak. Interesting. And it's always, I don't, using the word fun seems inappropriate. Here, <laughs> but knowing your local history and interesting, it's fun to learn your local history and what's going on there. So. So we talked about the Oregon Trail where I where I was going to school in sure. Oregon. Yeah. And uh, they talked about people eating people. So. Yes. That's, well, I was I was a kid in Nebraska. So like Lewis and Clark and all that oh, was yeah. really big there. You know, the Dakotas and everything. So that was a big part of elementary education there. As far as I know, they didn't eat anyone. 
It's, a it's little mostly lame. dysentery that got everybody, I think, yes. on that one, uh, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just some it. light nibbling. That's it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no actual eating. What what a great beer interview here. That's that right. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alicia, I guess to bring it back to, to beer a little bit, uh, you had a pretty big honor at uh, GABF back in 2018. You uh, uh, 50-51 Brewery Group of the Year, correct? We did, and we're still stunned about it You know, a year later. We still really haven't figured out how that happened, but we were – incredibly excited needless to say that's you know because that's something you think about it i had a a buddy make a comment last year when he saw the winners list from gabf he's like this doesn't seem like that big of a deal because there's so many of them but when you think about how many categories and entries there are i did the math and it was like something like four percent of entrants actually medal there yeah yeah so you know you may have 300 awards but that only represents four percent of the beers that were Top entered into four that. or five percent yeah yeah well, that's and, a big deal and then when yeah. you break it down to something like the brewery group of the year you know that's that's even you know even bigger there so what does that mean for your brewery kind of winning that to getting those accolades from the gabf well it means we all get to put that in our email signature which is you know pretty fun um it's nice. <laughs> yeah. but it was yeah. honestly it was really cool to bring that back to the local community. I mean, we're just thought of as the local watering hole. And so to be able to kind of celebrate something national here in our little hometown, I think it definitely kind of energized us even just from that perspective. You know, I don't know that it necessarily opened any new doors because Eclipse had already opened a lot of doors for us, but it certainly helped us follow through and that we're not a one trick pony. And I think that was really uh, what meant the most to us was that, yeah, like Eclipse won a medal, but so did, you know, a couple other beers and, you know, that one that wasn't even barrel aged. And so it, it kind of helped us break the preconceived notion of like, we only do Eclipse or we only do big, dark barrel aged beers. And, you know, there's more to us than that. That's, you know, if you do have to be a one trick pony, Eclipse is not a bad. <laughs> no, trick we, to have there, it's, right? it's pretty yeah. pretty fun pony. I'll, I won't lie. <laughs> Good stuff. Awesome. Well, you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take another break, but we'll be back very soon with more from Fifty Fifty Brewing. Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks, so you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing, establishing a new standard in craft beer. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Shake it, back. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash beerguys. Patrons get cool perks like Beer Guys swag, commercial-free episodes, and even bonus episodes that aren't available anywhere else. Now back to our conversation with 5050 Brewing's Alicia Barr. Brian, I think you actually had something that in your research prior to the show, you dug up some interesting info here that maybe a lot of people don't know about. You want to you wanna dive into that? Yeah, like an old 49er, I, I dug mind, up this nugget. Mind, mind <laughs> yeah, I got this little nugget. Good one there, Brian. Yeah, right? All right. Yeah. So I saw somewhere that, th- that uh, you guys were possibly involved in, invested in, or owned a distillery called Old Trestle Distillery, which is also in Truckee. Is, is that true? That is indeed true. I can confirm that st- statement. Um, yeah, we are the we're the managing partners of that uh, distillery. It's the first dis- legal, I should say, distillery in Truckee in over a hundred years. Um, so that was it's pretty exciting just to be a part of that kind of historical revolution. Um, and then we're also uh, a minority investor partner in that, as well as the managing partner. So it's a really fun 
projects to be involved in, especially as uh, I think everybody on, who listens to you guys knows beer and whiskey just go so well together. Oh, sure. Indeed. Yeah. We know that. We have yeah. tested that theory many times. Both yes. independently and them yes, together. Correct. Yes. So you know where I'm going with this. I'm going to have to ask, have you used any of the barrels from what you're producing there in your beer yet? We have indeed. So we haven't released any bourbon for actual sale yet. We've been laying it down in barrels for a few years now. And then just this last year for 2019, we did pull aside some of our original, more experimental bourbon barrels and did a batch of Eclipse with it. And it came out really well. Uh, It was definitely one of our hotter, because it was so young, um, versions of Eclipse. So for the people that like kind of more of that, you know, the heat forward variant, that's your that's your go-to right there. Um, but we've got a lot of fun collaboration projects between the two uh, moving forward, including maybe distilling. We've uh, set aside some vintage Eclipse that we're going to distill down and see what that lovely concoction will turn into. That sounds awesome. That Are you going to be amazing. doing any bourbon futures? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. I don't yeah, know. Right. I like that. Okay. I know we, right. we do have like, we've, just started launching locally kind of like various club level type things like a founders club where those are more for the uh, kind of the celebrity elite that like to come visit Truckee. They can purchase their own barrel and custom blend it with basically do their own custom bourbon with our distiller and sit on it and age it and they decide when they want it it's an entire barrel's worth so that's one of the things we're doing Um, but then we do have more of what I call like a you and me level club that, you know, first access to certain releases and things like that, that we're still kind of dialing through the details of that. I don't know that any of our distilleries here have any kind of, not that I've heard any kind of clubs or programs in that. You know, we have some breweries that do their special bottle clubs and that, but I haven't sure. heard anything from any of the distilleries. Not that I'm yeah, aware of. Interesting. And to, to back up a little bit, for those that may not be aware, you have done futures on Eclipse before, correct? Or do you do that every year? We've done that every year, I think since 2009. Yeah, so almost the entirety of Eclipse, we've been doing futures on it. Okay, that's pretty cool. And that's something I've read that the first time you did it, and you mentioned earlier in the show that there's not a bounty of warehouse space in Truckee. So you right. actually took the futures, the funds from the futures, and had to rent several <laughs> warehouses to, to barrel aid in, right? Exactly. So, you know, the... Okay. the what is it that necessity is the mother of invention? Like we needed cash flow in order to grow Eclipse because we knew there was demand. And so by introducing futures, we could get that cash flow to then invest in grow Eclipse. And it's been a, you know, pretty symbiotic relationship since then, you know, with the idea that you get, you're guaranteed as a futures purchaser, your allocation of what you've selected. Um, and there have been styles almost every year that sell out via futures and don't end up going to distribution because they futures is first dibs since they put up the money up front. So it sounds like Makes people sense. responded fairly favorably to the futures idea, correct? Yeah, actually much more so than we had expected. You know, we thought it was a cool idea. Let's see what happens. And then it took me two weeks just to compile all the orders and figure out what we were doing. <laughs> and since <laughs> sure. then, it's, yeah. we've learned that yeah, it's become a much more automated process since, since then, um, not printing out manual orders. And I had like two binders worth of trying to sort everything. And it was pretty comical that, that first year. Yeah, it was interesting. We know a guy, again, the cigar business that did futures, and he came from the wine world and did and said, hey, no one's done cigar futures before, so I'm going to do it on this vintage. And uh, it was not met favorably. Yeah, at, at interesting. All. Yeah, people didn't like the idea of doing he, the futures with cigars. So You would think they would do better yeah. as that is a luxury item and in, in, inclined right. towards the folks that would be interested in buying Features on things. No, and his oddly, brand specifically not, was yeah. a very high end, well respected yeah. brand. So, if any brand it was going to be received well with, you would think it would have been would have been those cigars. But no, no, they weren't having. Well, it. S- well, speaking of the futures, you do that in spring, right? So that means the the eclipse for this coming year is going into futures, right? Yeah. So um, tax day every year is when we release the futures ah. sales. That way, people can kind of count on it in their calendar, and it's you know kind of the upside to tax day. But yeah, we'll have most of our styles fully confirmed by then. We always add styles after the futures release that just aren't part of the futures program, but end up going into distribution and regular retail. But we'll probably have at least six varieties that we are 100% confident in the, you know, the volumes of in order to launch futures. 
Okay, so it's not the complete set because I know there were like seventeen variants in two thousand nineteen. Are you gonna? <laughs> are you likely to hit that same number this year, or was that just a, l- a little high? Well, no. Every year, my brewers promise me we're gonna do less styles, and every year we do more. <laughs> right. So, I, yeah. as much as I would like to say it's gonna be twelve or less this year, I am not holding my breath on that. But we have found that, you know, especially with the evolution of the pastry stout and barrel aged beer in general, that having five different isolated barrel styles is not as appealing as it was for the market as it was like five or six years ago. And so we'll probably only do a couple. We'll do some kind of cuvee, whether it's a rye or a bourbon cuvee. And then we'll probably do a lot more of like the interesting, you know, we did a Vietnamese coffee eclipse this year that was to die for it was a cold pressed coffee with sweet cream in the eclipse that sounds great Um, yeah Yeah. and then we did well we might do some more cocktail inspired ones like uh, my favorite this year we did a manhattan cherry rye and so it was nice aged separately in rye whiskey vermouth and cherry brandy and then blended together and the vermouth added this like really subtle but fantastic finish that i've never experienced in a dark beer before because it's just not what you're expecting. You know, you get the roasty, you get the bitter, but just that subtle dry vermouth character right at the very end was pretty spectacular. So we're hoping to do something like that again this year. Will you have another Jägermeister variant in this coming year? Uh, If we can get the barrels. Those were, (laughs) we only got four of those to begin with, and I'm not sure that source exists for us anymore, but we're always looking for kind of those one-off, you know, eye-catching, fun flavor profiles to work with brian you i'm gonna let you take this i was gonna ask about this i was gonna ask is jägermeister something that actually comes from a barrel because something something tells me that that's not the case but maybe somebody (laughs) inoculated a barrel with it or something like that no it actually they're part of the process i I learned this too because when our brewers told us that we got jägermeister barrels that was my exact response was i didn't think it came from barrels but there is an (laughs) element of the process that actually does involve a barrel, and then it goes into another blending process from there, um, or even further distillation after that. But there absolutely is, because these all have like the logo, the trademark, all of that. Um, So they're legitimately from from the town of Wolfenbüttel, um, because we couldn't use Jägermeister on the label. We called it Wolfenbüttel. (laughs) Okay. Um, But yeah, it was, we all learned a little something about Jägermeister that day. And how did that play in Eclipse? You definitely have to like the, you know, that more okay. fennel anise character. <laughs> sure. yeah. yeah. And people who like it loved it, but it was, it it was not as high in demand as we had kind of hoped, but I mean, that's Jägermeister for you. It's a very polarizing flavor profile. Absolutely. We tried the one from Stone, the, what's it, Arrogant Bastard? Oh Jaeger. yeah, the Jäger And Bastard, we said the yes. same thing. It was kind of a yeah. thing. It's like, look, you really have to like Jägermeister to enjoy this. Did you have to store those bottles in the freezer? Because that's what you do with a bottle of Jägermeister. <laughs> that's right. Maybe that would that would be an interesting little play. At the right? Bar. Yeah. Try yeah. it out there. Little mini bottles of that. Get you a <laughs> Jaeger bomb with Eclipse Jaeger and that. Awesome. Well, Alicia, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, great to talk to you and enjoy some of your delicious beers. Now, if people want to know more about what is going on with 5050 Brewing, what is the best way for them to do that? Check out our website, 5050brewing.com. Um, and we also, you know, Instagram. I think we're at 5050brewery on Instagram and, and Facebook. And we kind of give a lot of, especially with regards to futures, a lot of that information gets put out there. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Have a great day. You bet. You too. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show. Make sure to join us next week as we talk with Chris and Rob from Wild Leap Brew Company. Local brewery, Brian, making yes. some waves there. USA Today's Brewery of the Year. So Experimental hops on there. the way. Yeah. So for more craft beer info, follow us online. We are Beer Guys Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great week, and don't forget to drink local. Cheers. Cheers.